And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. All right. Turn your Bibles, if you will, please, to 1 John. First John chapter 3, verse 14. I'm going to fix this wire, otherwise I'm going to end up catching on something and breaking the thing. First John 3, 14. <clears throat> We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Amen. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And let's open up in a word of prayer. Amen. Father, we come before you this morning and are very grateful for your salvation. It's uh, such an incredible salvation. Uh, when we first learn about it, we're concerned about judgment, concerned about hell, concerned about uh, you know, uh, being apart from you forever. And we see the opportunity of heaven. You know, such a blessing, such a wonderful thing. And we hear the gospel that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. And that he rose from the dead. And that he offers a very real salvation, completely free. And we take it. And we don't realize all the other benefits and things that happen to us when we do. And we can study this for our entire lives and never plumb the depths of the salvation you've given us. And we haven't even seen heaven yet. And just thank you, Lord. Pray please help me to get across this aspect of salvation. Uh, please accompany this message with your spirit. Please forgive me my, my sins, Lord. And uh, cleanse my heart. Make me a fit vessel for your spirit today. Bring conviction, bring comfort, bring encouragement, Lord, however people need it. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going through, at a very slow pace, the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we were talking about the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ by John the Baptist, and that immediately afterwards... The Father identified our Lord Jesus Christ as His Son. Uh, there was two ways He identified the Lord Jesus Christ. The first way was by direct declaration. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the second way He identified the Lord Jesus Christ as His Son was by the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given to Jesus Christ in a completely unmeasured degree. Uh, never happened before, never happened afterwards. The Bible says the Spirit is given without measure unto Him. And the interesting thing is, is the Father identifies us as His sons and daughters the same way. There's a direct declaration. We read in the Bible, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. We read in 1 John 1.12, But as many as received Him... To them gave he power or authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Those are direct declarations, the same as the Father gave to his Son Jesus Christ through words he gives to us when we get, when we get saved. He declares us to be his children. And the same way the Father gave the Holy Spirit to our Lord Jesus Christ as an identifying of Him as His, as his child, as His Son, He gives to us also. Now, we're not the Son of God the same way Jesus Christ is. Uh, we're not eternal. We haven't existed with the Father for, from eternity past. We're not of the same essence, as it were, like Jesus Christ is. But we are His children. We who trust Christ as our Savior have been born again and are actually children of God. Amen. But He gives us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is an identifying mark where the Father identifies us as His children. 
went from there into evidence of the Holy Spirit. How do we know that we have the Holy Spirit? And I pointed out that just as the book of Romans is the schematic for salvation, if you want to understand what your salvation is, the book of Romans is the schematic, is the uh, diagram, delineates point by point all the pertinent aspects of our salvation. But the book of 1 John is the same thing about the Holy Spirit. Now, the book of 1 John delineates what the Holy Spirit in a person's life looks like. We talked about one of the evidences of the Holy Spirit was fellowship with God. We want to have fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ, with the Father. Um, and we want it so badly that we change our life. We begin obeying Jesus Christ, obeying His commandments. Whereas before we didn't, uh, myself specifically, I didn't care two wits whether I obeyed God or not. I trusted Christ as my Savior, and I found that my heart had been changed, and I didn't do it. Amen. For the first time in my life, I wanted to be right with Jesus Christ. I loved being in fellowship with Jesus Christ, and it was like it physically hurt if I, if I had sinned and my fellowship was broken. And it caused me to radically change my life. Whereas before, I did as much bad as I get away with because I could and I wanted to. Now, I wanted to be right with Jesus Christ and it changed my life. It changed my, the direction of my life. And secondly, another evidence of the Holy Spirit is loving the brethren. We just read that here. And there are three characteristics of loving the brother, the brethren. The first is fellowship. In 1 John 1, 7, it talks about us having fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ and desiring fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's, uh, that's the first part or the first, uh, I guess the, uh, the lowest common denominator, if you will, of loving the brethren is, 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 is fellowship. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 14, which we just read, let's keep reading a little bit to uh, go on. 14, it says, uh, we've read that, read verse 15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? So we see the second characteristic of loving our brethren is a genuine desire to help. If our brother or sister is in, in Christ, has a need, there's something within us that says, I'm going to help him out. I want to help him out. I want to try to help fix this situation. And sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. I think one of the reasons we have differing spiritual gifts is so that more of the needs can actually be met. Um, but a third one is also emotional tenderness, 1 Corinthians 13. We're not going to get into this today. We're going to probably get into this next week. Um, the other aspects of loving the brethren. But 1 Corinthians 13 in the great love chapter describes what love looks like, what charity looks like. And it points out that, you know, you can meet people's need without loving them. Well, how do you do that? Well, I mean, when you, guy has got a need and, and, and you meet it, it can be kind of a, a, an ego boosting thing sometimes. Now, a person who loves is going to try to meet the needs, but you, just because you try to meet the needs doesn't, doesn't mean you love. But along with that is emotional tenderness, compassion, long-suffering, patience, various things that they're also characteristics of this love. Last week I taught on fellowship, and I'm going to teach you a little bit more on that. Um, the Christian's desire for fellowship with other Christians. And I mentioned that when I was younger, I was having doubts about my salvation. My, my dad pointed out and said, you know, you love the brethren. You love other Christians. I said, yeah, that's true. Um, I prefer the company of Christians. I didn't before I was saved, but all of a sudden I, you know, all of a sudden I, I did. I love being around Christians. They're the most interesting people in the world to me. Um, he, he said, 
You know, loving the brethren is not a natural thing. It's not natural to love Christians. I thought about that. Yeah, that's actually true. And I asked last week, and called several people out, you know, and asked them, did you love born again Christians before you got saved? And the universal answer was, no, I didn't. I had no desire to be around them. So, loving the brethren is not natural to human beings. I want to go into that in more detail tonight, today, because loving the brethren is a lot more unnatural than you think. We, we understand that it's not natural. We who've experienced a change of going from finding Christians the most boring, irritating people in the world to loving them passionately, and we wonder at that, it's a lot more unnatural than we think. Let's go to first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I think you'll find this interesting. I hope you do. For me it was incredibly interesting as I, as I studied this out and unpacked it. Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of His knowledge by us in every place. That's a lot of confusing words, but make manifest, that means to show to everyone. The savor of His knowledge, uh, what that actually if you, it means is kind of like the spiritual smell of knowing Christ. The spiritual smell of knowing Christ, the savor. For we are unto God a sweet savor in Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. In other words, when we're born again, we have a spiritual smell. Okay? And everybody smells it. The people who are saved smell it. The people who are lost smell it. All right? To the one, we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other, the savor of life unto life. So, to a lost person, we've got a smell. That smell is a smell of death. The smell of death. We smell like a rotting carcass, in a spiritual sense, if you will, to the unsaved. To the degree we love Jesus Christ, we're an abomination to people. They don't like being around us. Vice versa, to those who are saved, we've got the spiritual smell of life unto life. Oftentimes I can sense a Christian just by looking at him across the room. I'm serious as a heart attack. They've got a, a smell. And it's an immensely attractive smell to me. If I find somebody that, uh, uh, walking down the street, talk to somebody, find out they love Jesus Christ, there's a closeness I get immediately. I love being around people who love Jesus Christ. Uh, it's, just, it's just a phenomenon. So, why are born again Christians, because of the smell, why are we unattractive to the lost? Why? Well, we are. How many would agree? I mean, people look at me like a calf at a new gate. But how many agree, just nod your heads, that, that by and large we're unattracted to the lost? We are. Shady, were you attracted to Christians before you got saved? No. Oh. Ran like crazy. <laughs> but that's just a common experience. I grew up in a Christian home. I should have been attracted to them. I, I wasn't. They bored me to tears. If somebody in the church loved Jesus Christ, they were the person I avoided. I liked the people in church who didn't care two wits about Jesus Christ. And they were my friends. So that's just how, how that is. But why? Why do we smell like death to them? Because I think we're going to see that we are kind of death to them. We are. Let's unpack this a little bit. 
Romans chapter 3, verse 23. We know the verse. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. People who are in their sins are other than the glory of God. They don't have the glory of God. They're separate from the glory of God. They're apart from the glory of God. Those who are lost are separated from the glory of God. Now, there's two, when you read, go through the Bible, there's two pictures of God's glory. There's the glory of, he ha, He's very glorious. He has a great reputation. He uh, has a reputation of judgment, reputation of power, rep, all, all this reputation stuff, and the honor and the majesty of God that is shown, and that's described as glory. But there's another aspect of glory that's not as often seen in the Old Testament. I want to take a look at that. Let's go to Exodus chapter 24. It's like an aura, like a glow, if you will. Exodus 24. Verse 15. And Moses went up in went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now look at verse 17. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. So you got this, this mountain. Now their mountains there weren't as high as ours. But it was, a, it was a large hill at least. And uh, on the top of this thing there was a cloud and there was fire, what appeared to be fire, on the top of that mount. Let's go to uh, 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. So, in this passage, the, uh, King Solomon has built a temple, and they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant and the, uh, the mercy seat into the Holy of Holies. Now, the Holy of Holies is a special part of the temple that only the high priest can go in, and then only once a year, because the presence of God is in the Holy of Holies. And uh, so, they're, they're, this is a very special part. This is actually the, the entire heart of the temple itself. And they're putting the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant, or putting the Ark of the Covenant into the Holy of Holies. And we start reading here at uh, verse 5. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the Ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen and could, uh, that could not be told or numbered for multitude. And the priests brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord unto his place. And the oracle of the house or into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. So they had two giant uh, statues of cherubims there. And the cherubims spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims covered the ark and the staves thereof above. And they drew out the staves, that the ends of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle, and they were not seen without. And there they are unto this day. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone which Moses put there at Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass, when the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. In other words, the glory of the Lord so filled the temple Nobody could stand and minister in it. Uh, Second Chronicles, uh, chapter seven, relating to the same thing, says they couldn't even come into the temple. It was too overwhelming. It was too powerful. Let's go back to Exodus chapter thirty-three. So the glory of the Lord, in this sense, is an actual aura around him. I believe it's his very essence. But it's, uh, it, it, it's a powerful thing that is very influencing on people. 
So, Exodus chapter 33, verse 17. In this passage, Moses is asking to see God's glory. 33, 17. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. He asked Jehovah, would you please show me your glory? I want to see your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, that the, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. So there's a glory that comes from the face of the Lord that is brilliant, is completely powerful, and is deadly to sinful man. Uh, the pure, undiluted glory of God is actually death to sinful man. Now there are people in the Bible who saw God and lived. They saw God's face and lived but only when God had veiled himself in human flesh. Abraham saw God and talked with him face to face in the plains of Mamre. But that was God coming in a human form, probably in a human, human body. And I, I believe that's actually a, 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 was, was actually Jesus Christ in that situation. But um, the, seeing God as spirit and the undiluted glory that comes from the face of God is deadly to human beings. Deadly to sinful man. <clears throat> Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> Verse 12. <clears throat> And here is where uh, John comes face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. Now, now John is saved in this situation, but he is not, he doesn't have a glorified body here. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, it, uh, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And we'll see that sword here in a second. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So John said, looking at the face of our Lord Jesus Christ, his face was like looking into the sun. <clears throat> and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth, and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. Amen and amen. But that, the effect of the glory of God on someone who their sins are washed away, was still extremely powerful. He said he fell at his, at, his, at his feet as dead. Now, talked about a sword coming out of his mouth. Let's go to Revelation 19.15. We're going to see that a little bit. Revelation 19. Verse 15. <coughs> Actually, we're going to start in verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. 
And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So, our Lord Jesus Christ is coming down from heaven to judge the world. And we're coming with him. Are there animals in heaven? Well, there are at least horses. Because <laughs> we're going to be riding horses. And we're coming down with him out of heaven. And he's going to judge the nations. Now, let's keep reading here. And out of his mouth, verse 15, goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Okay? So, once you see this sharp sword coming out of his mouth. Now, with that in, in mind, let's compare that passage to Zechariah chapter 14, which goes into details. Uh, that's the, the heavenly perspective. Zechariah 14 goes into the earthly perspective of that same event. So, Zechariah 14, verse 12. This gets a little bit macabre. Zechariah is right before Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. Zechariah 14, verse 12. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. That's pretty gross. You have these armies that have converged upon Israel. And we see that today. Okay? We see that being formed today. The, the rising anti-Semitism in the world is the precursor to what he's talking about here. All right? So, the result is Jesus Christ Himself is going to come down with all those who have been born again following Him. Now, we're not, we're not contributing to this. He does it all by Himself. But when He comes down, the Bible says, the sword out of His mouth literally blasts the armies as they're standing there. It blasts their flesh, their muscles, their eyes. Everything about them is blasted away from them while they're still standing. It sounds like a, a Marvel movie of some sort. But this is the effect, I believe, of the glory of God, the undiluted glory of God upon sinful man. Is death. Is death. Turn to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, when our Lord Jesus Christ was on earth, He did not lose an ounce of His godness, of His godhood. He was fully man and yet fully God. As such, He had the glory of God. He was the glory of God, and He had the glory of God in Him. And we see here in the transfiguration... Jesus Christ reveals His glory to His disciples. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, His brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. His face did shine as the sun, and His raiment was white as the light. So He allowed His glory to come through and show His disciples who He really was. But normally, in, in his, his normal ministry, that wasn't as obvious. But yet, His glory was still there. And His glory actually drove normally sane people crazy. Pastor Sean alluded to that last Sunday. It caused people to do crazy things. And we're going to see this. Go to Matthew chapter 27. The glory of God... The veiled glory of God drives the unregenerate crazy. Chapter 27, verse 15. Now at that feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Another place says he was guilty of insurrection and murder. And he was famous. Everybody knew Barabbas. 
Okay? Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? Jesus was also famous. He was famous for going, if, if it were modern day times, he would be famous for going to the hospitals and going floor by floor and emptying the hospitals. Cancer, no problem. Heart disease, no problem. Diabetes, no problem. Whatever the situation is, one touch of him, one word from him, and you get up perfectly hill and walk out of the hospital. Amen. Now think about that. If we had something like that today. In other words, we would all know that this is a very unique thing. It's not like we can duplicate what he's doing. While he's here, we have this possibility of healing and it's probably never going to happen again in the history of man. This is a very unique possibility. And we're faced with a situation. The president says, someone's going to die. It's either going to be Jesus Christ, this incredible healer, or it's going to be Jeffrey Dahmer, the serial murderer. Who do you choose? They chose Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer lives. Jesus Christ dies. Yeah. Why in heaven's name would they do that? Because of the glory of God. Because of the glory of God. The glory of God in Jesus Christ was death to their sinful selves. You know, we unfortunately identify with our, with our sin nature. We think, see, I tell lies and I guess I'm a liar. And in a sense, that's true. But it's not necessarily true. Homosexuals say, I'm, I am a homosexual. Okay? And in a sense, that's true, but it's not necessarily true. Um, whatever a person's sin is, they tend to identify with it. And so, something that challenges that sin nature is killing them. By the way, we are not our sins. We who get saved, we are not our sins. We are not our sin nature. We may have sinful flesh still attached to us, but we are not sinners. We are the children of God, and we will be completely glorified, and we will exist quite comfortably, completely apart from any aspect of our sin. Amen and amen. amen. But the lost person doesn't see that. They feel the glory of God as an acid, if you will, eroding into them, killing them. Now, with Jesus Christ, they, you could either repent and get saved, accepting His judgment, accepting His mercy, accepting His salvation, accepting His forgiveness. You could do that, and that would alleviate that enormous pressure they felt. Or you could run away, or you could try to kill Jesus. And that's what they eventually did. Because they had to get that glory away from them. That glory was killing them. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stone, so it's talking about uh, the, the, the Mount Sinai experience. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Now hold on. Just like there was a glory surrounding Mount Sinai. And when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he glowed with the glory of God so much that it, and it bothered so many people that he had to put a veil over his face. And that glory is less than the glory of the Holy Spirit in us when we get saved. Let's keep reading. 
How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of, the condemn, ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious hath no glory in this, in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. Let's go down to verse 18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We have the glory of God within us. That's simply a fact. When we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, and the Holy Spirit indwells us, He indwells us with His glory. We have the glory of God in us. And it emanates from us. When we talk and when we don't talk. The way we live our lives reinforces it, but there's actually a something within us that emanates out that is the glory of God. We have that. We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. We who are saved, when we meet another Christian, we don't know anything about them. But there's an instinctive love that passes between us and them and them and us. It's instinctive. It's not something we have to work up. It's just there. They have the Holy Spirit in them. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We sense it in them, they sense it in us. And it's instinctive. And it's quite powerful. It's also very, very unnatural. It is not natural for sinful man to love the glory of God. It's not natural. In fact, it is extremely unnatural. Sinful man is revolted by the glory of God. Sinful man is frightened by the glory of God. Sinful man turns away from the glory of God. Sinful man resists the glory of God. But we who are saved don't. We who are saved don't. We love it. And this is why this is powerful evidence. Our love for the brethren is powerful evidence that we have the Holy Spirit, because only the Holy Spirit changing our lives would cause us to love someone in whom is the glory of God. When throughout history, everybody else who did not know God, did not have His Spirit, was terrified and ran away. We don't. We love. So loving the brethren, we know we have passed from death into life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. So as uh, my dad told me back when I was a child, or a young man, he said, you know, you love the brethren. That's not a natural thing. The only reason you love the brethren is because the Holy Spirit lives in you. Someone said, well, you know, I, I grew up in, in a church. All I've known are Christians, and, and of, of course I love the brethren. Whether I'm saved or not, that's not true. I've taught Sunday school classes for years among kids who grew up in Christian homes. And a whole lot of them didn't love me and instinctively resisted me, instinctively tried to block their ears somehow so they didn't have to hear me. And when you watched them, they didn't hang around the Christian kids. They hung around the lost. And they had grown up in a Christian home. Their parents were Christians. Their siblings were uh, uh, Christians. But they sure didn't love the brethren the same as I didn't before I actually got saved. Our love for the brethren, our instinctive desire for fellowship with Christians, our instinctive love that causes us to, oh wow, so-and-so, he's kind of hurting. I need to find some way to help him. Let me go talk to him, try to comfort him, or whatever. That instinctive desire 
That only comes. That only comes. That only comes through the Holy Spirit. We know we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. Amen. Let's pray. Father, just pray you please bless this message. There's someone here who would say, you know, I'm that person who really doesn't like Christians. I like the world. I like the lost. Would you please bring them to salvation today? And those of who might be doubting their salvation say, you know, yeah, I got doubts, but you know, I really do love the brethren. Please comfort them, Lord. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.